In this video, I would like to, to tell you about how clocks work and how all the clocks tick at the same rate, how they, if they're synchronized, how they manage to solve, to show exactly the same time and independently of the mechanism. So I will divide this video into chapters, uh, some of them a bit more technical, that goes into physics, but hopefully not too deep. So the first thing that I would like to discuss is what is time. So of all the physical quantities and dimensions, time is the most elusive one and the hardest one to define. And actually, un our understanding of time evolved and the definitions uh, were changing. So it's still the hardest to understand and to define. We also know uh, one of the surprising consequences of the special theory of relativity and the general later is that time is relative to the observer and um, you can look up such things as twin paradox to uh, find some things counterintuitive notions uh, about time. And also we know that time is affected by gravity. Like the gravity that result is a result, results in the curvature of space time and as a result, where there's gravitational fields which, is, which are stronger, where they're stronger, the clocks tick slower. So we can even think of gravity as something that arises from uh, clocks differing at, clicking at different rates at different regions of space-time. And so in order to understand time, uh, we need to observe some physical system. For example, this one, you know, we see this pendulum that is oscillating and we see that this physical system transitions from one state to another. And then when we see this change in the state of system, uh, we interpret time as something that occurred in, in, this, in this change from one state to another. Uh, Einstein was once jokingly uh, quoted to say that time is what clocks measure, but it is not that simple. And so of the understanding today, we have the physical quantities. So we have the basic units, that's the gravitational constant, Planck's uh, constant h bar actually divided by 2 pi and the speed of light and as it turns out if we do dimensional analysis here we see that from those units we can construct only one quantity that has units of lengths so it's actually g h bar divided by c to the power of 3 square root of this this is called the Planck's length and this is roughly 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters and we can also uh, construct Planck's time. So what this says to us, according to modern physics interpretation and understanding, the space is discrete with those kind of jumps. We cannot possibly measure a physical distance that is smaller than this gap. And uh, Planck's time would be LP, Planck's length divided by the speed of light. Therefore, the uh, smallest conceivable time gap or time uh, jump is this Planck's time, where we take Planck's length, it's actually the time that is required for light to travel Planck's length. And this is on the order, I wouldn't say uh, exactly what the coefficient here, but it's 10 to the minus uh, 44 seconds, something like that, 44 or uh, 45, roughly, but on the scale. So time is discrete with those jumps. Right, and so another interesting uh, feature of time is that we know that the laws of physics, such as Newton's law of motion, they are symmetric with respect to time reversal. And so from the basic laws of motion, it seems that uh, if we reverse time, it also is also a solution. So it shouldn't be impossible to go back in time. And yet, from what we observe, time has a clear direction. And I could say jokingly from past to future. But what actually sets this direction of time? There's also, physics also gives an answer to this. Uh, and the answer is actually encoded in the second law of thermodynamics. And let me, uh, let me explain why. So if we see a video with an egg that is breaking and we rewind it backwards and we see that egg from a broken state is being unbroken, we would know that something, somebody messed with this video. Something is wrong in this video, right? Something doesn't make sense. And the reason is that the second law of thermodynamics says that a closed system, in a closed system, uh, the entropy can only grow. And so there are certain, certain transitions that are possible and those that are not possible. So we can only go in transitions 
from lower entropy to higher entropy and not vice versa. And so this was set the direction of time. Now, uh, another thing that is related to this is the question, the, the paradox we can always try to ask, right? But the question, what was before the Big Bang? And the answer to this question is that, well, it's time didn't exist before the Big Bang. Therefore, we cannot ask what was before it. This question uh, doesn't make sense. Because before the Big Bang, there was no physical system we could observe. And as a result, we couldn't, time didn't exist. Time exists only as we observe a physical system changing its state. Uh, so, so time did, didn't, didn't exist before the Big Bang. And uh, yeah, that's uh, a bit counterintuitive, but, but that's just it. We always need a physical system uh, in order to observe uh, time. Okay, so uh, let us see uh, how this clock is built. So we have a pendulum here. Let me just stretch a little bit. This is the mainstream. This is what stores the energy. And so the physical system, in order to oscillate, it requires energy. And this is the pendulum. And so we see that in this clock, uh, the pendulum is oscillating and the physical system is changing, uh, changing its state. And we interpret it as a passage of time. In fact, if we didn't have memory, then we couldn't perceive time because we wouldn't be able to know that there was a change in the state, that there was a transition. So the fact that we have memory allows us to perceive time. Uh, yeah. So uh, let us now consider the system and, and see how this clock works. By the way, the uh, definition of time, uh, the, the ancient one, right? was that we had day and night, and we could say, we could define time as the time that requires for Earth to complete a full revolution around its axis is 24 hours. And therefore, 1 24th of this is one hour. And if we divide an hour into 60 arbitrarily, to 60 fragments, then uh, 1 60th of an hour is a minute, and then we divide the minute into 60 intervals more, and we get the second. But, you know, this definition is not very precise, and then the definition was refined. So today, uh, one second is defined in terms of observing the oscillations of uh, the cesium atom in its hyperfine transition. And basically, we can measure uh, the energy of light that is emitted, and energy is related to its frequency, and from the frequency, we can deduce time, and we have very accurate atomic clocks. But let us now go back to here. So let us try and see how exactly this clock works and how does the pendulum regulate the pace of time here. Uh, so by the way, the idea of uh, introducing the pendulum to a clock to regulate its pace, its rhythm was due to Christian Huygens and it really boosted the accuracy of the clocks that were before that. So let us now analyze the pendulum problem. So suppose we have here a string, and we have a small mass here, m, and it is in the gravitational field, g of the Earth. By the way, you can object and say this is an idealization, this is a mathematical pendulum, and you don't have a point particle mass, and mass is distributed. But actually, if you do a, a more general analysis, you could see that, in fact, even if you take a physical pendulum with uh, some mass distribution, and you gotta do the right analysis, then you could say that equivalently, uh, if this is the, the point and uh, of fixation and there is the center of mass, we can still think of it as a mathematical pendulum with all mass being concentrated at the center of mass. So let's try and analyze this problem of the pendulum oscillation. So suppose that the angle that we have here is theta. And okay, this force mg here, that force of gravity can be decomposed into two components. Uh, if this is angle theta, so this is mg sine of theta, and this is mg cosine of theta. Now this component is canceled by the tension in the stream. So what actually accelerates this bead uh, at the end here 
is this tangential force. And so let us try to construct the equations of motion for this. So if the length of the pendulum is L, then the length of, of this interval, if theta is in radians, is L times theta. And so the acceleration would be the second derivative of this with respect to time. And if we multiply it by the mass, that this is actually the force. And we would write that this is equal to mg sine of theta, but almost. We actually need to add a minus sign and here. And the reason for the minus sign is that this force is always opposing the growth of theta. theta. So for example, if the bead is moving here and theta tends to grow, then the force is going to be opposing the growth and tends to, it wants to return to theta to have smaller value. So this is the reason for the minus sign here. And this equation can be rewritten as the second derivative of theta with respect to time is theta dot dot is uh, plus sine of theta equals zero. So this equation is highly nonlinear, and we can actually derive an expression for time uh, with elliptic functions. It's more involved and complicated, but let's try to use the harmonic oscillator approximation. So as you can see here, this pendulum oscillates with uh, very small angles, like roughly, I think, one degree. And so for small angles and radians, there's actually a pretty good approximation that sine of theta is roughly theta. And actually, an analysis, when we analyze the exact solution for this and for the approximated, we see that it, it can be argued that for small angles, this, the solutions to this equation, where we replace sine of theta by theta, still produce fairly accurate results. Now, this equation is very well known. This is the equation for the harmonic oscillator, and it has a solution of the form, so if we denote by omega, uh, it's, g, uh, it's, it's g over L, omega squared, right? This is omega squared, then the solution to this equation would be uh, theta of t, equals a cosine omega t plus some phase t. This is uh, a and phi could be determined from, determined from initial conditions. But the important thing is that this function is periodic. And actually the period, the time period for an oscillation is the smallest positive t uh, that is strictly bigger than zero such that theta of t plus t equals the theta of t for every uh, t for every small t, this holds. And actually, uh, from properties of the trigonometric functions, we can easily determine that uh, capital T is 2 pi, the square root of L over G. And so let's see what uh, it says to us. So in fact, let us write it in the following way. It's 2 pi over the square root of T times the square root of L. Now let us look at this quantity over here, it turns out that the numerical value of this, it has physical dimensions, uh, but uh, we would ignore it for now. So the numerical value of this is actually surprisingly close to 2, roughly 2.02. .02. And the reason for this is the following one. So we know that uh, g is uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. And one remark is that since uh, Earth is not a perfect sphere, right? It's uh, here, the radius here at the poles is a bit smaller. It's not a perfect sphere, then actually G varies depending on where you are. It's a small variation, but still this variation exists. And uh, here uh, G would be bigger and here it would be a bit smaller. And so in this clock, actually they thought about this. So the idea, we would see the reason for this, but uh, the length, the effective length, there, there's actually a weight here. And by turning this bolt in here, you can actually affect the position of this weight and therefore affect the effective center of mass of this pendulum and therefore affect its effective length. Uh, and as a result, affect its oscillation time and adjust it to the correct value of G. So of course, this clock is not super accurate, but it's, it's a nice feature that you can adjust the oscillation period. So, so we have 
we have this. And yeah, let's get back. So G is 9.88 meters per second squared. And actually, if we were to compute pi squared, then this is roughly 9.86. Uh, 9 so, uh, square root of, uh, so square root of G is roughly pi. And this is the reason that it's so close to 2. Now, for this pendulum, L was chosen to be 0. Point, it's actually 25 centimeters, or it's 0. 0.25 meters. Uh, and so the square root of L uh, would be 0. 0.5, or just a half. Uh, the, the units, the physical units, are uh, square roots of lengths, but nevertheless. Uh, so what this tells us is that t equals uh, it's half times uh, 2.02, .02, so t is roughly one second. Now let us see how knowing the period time for this pendulum actually allows us to to see how this clock shows the right amount of time. Okay, so uh, this wheel, this gear, is called the escape wheel. It's unique in its shape and it has an ingenious design. And this is called, called this is the pendulum and this is called the, the pellet. So it is divided to 20 segments in this case. And therefore this, uh, this gear completes one revolution, one revolution every 20 seconds. Every 20 seconds it completes one revolution. So in three revolutions, one minute has passed, right? So once this completed three revolutions, one minute has passed. Now, what does it tell us about how much the minutes dial is supposed to move, right? So in an hour, there are 60 minutes. So in, in a full turn of the minutes dial, there's supposed to be 60 minutes, right? So on each minute that passes, the minute style is supposed to complete one sixties over revolution. Therefore, the minute style rotates 180 times slower than this gear. And let us see how do we convert this? How is it accomplished in, in this clock? So I have a rough uh, diagram here of this clock and we'll see how it works. So, we have this gear, uh, which is the escape wheel, and it is connected at its center. We see this gear with 10 T's. We can see it over here. It has 10 T's. And this gear actually sets in motion. It is in mesh with this gear that is a bit obscured, but maybe from here we can see it. It has 30 T's. It has 30 T's, so we have a conversion rate of 1 to 30, uh, one, uh, of 10 to 30. So we have a conversion rate of 10 to 30, and maybe it would be easier to see in this diagram. So we have this escape wheel, and it has 20 T's, and at the center there is this gear of 10. It is connected to this gear of 30, and so from here to here, we have a conversion rate of 10 to 30. Now, furthermore, if we continue from this gear, this is the gear, its center is here. It also has 10 T's, and it is in mesh with this gear that has 40 T's. So we then have a conversion rate, a conversion ratio, sorry, of 10 to 40. It is here. So we went from here, from this 10, 10 to 30, and from this 10, 10 to 40, and from this 40, this 10, you can see it here. So this is the 10 of the uh, 40 gear. It is in mesh with this gear of 50, this big gear. It is in mesh with this. So we have then 10 to 50. And the center of the 50 gear is here. It has 10 T's. All right, so we have, it has 10 T's and it goes directly to the minute dial, which has 30 T's. So we finally have a conversion rate of 10 to 30. And all in all, if we combine it, 10 to 30 is three times and 10 to 40 is four times and then 10 to 50 is five times and then again 10 to 30 is three more times which is 180 right as expected so we have the correct 
space of time for the minute style. And now, uh, let us see how we convert from the rotation from minutes to hours. So once the minute style completed a full revolution, one hour has passed. Now in this full revolution here, we have 12 hours. So this means that the hours dial, once this completes the full revolution, the hours dial is supposed to complete one twelfth of a revolution. And let's see that this is indeed the case. So this is the minutes dial and we have this gear of 10, which is in mesh with this gear of 40. So we have 10 to 40, which is goes from the minutes to here. And this 40 gear has as the center this 10, which is in mesh with this gear of 30. So we have again 10 to 30, and all in all, a conversion rate of four times three, which is 12. So we get, get the correct phase from the minutes to the hours, and that's how we set the pace for the clock. By the way, uh, just a remark here. So this pendulum is oscillating, and of course there's friction, so energy is being lost to friction. And as a result, uh, it is uh, supposed to eventually stop. So it is supposed to have some energy reservoir that will allow it to continue to oscillate. And the energy reservoir is this mainspring that we, by stretching it, we store energy in the system. And all those gears actually uh, are rotating, but they're rotating too slowly for us to notice. So we wind the, the spring in this direction and it wants to un unwind in this direction. So this introduces a tension in, in this wheel, pushes against this one and this pushes against this one all the way up to, escape, up to the escape wheel. Now notice that this ingenious design, ingenious design here that we have with, with the pellet here. At the end of their interaction, you see that the uh, escape wheel kind of gives the push to the pendulum and so it returns to it the energy that was lost due to friction. And the energy is stored in this mainspring. And as a result of this uh, pendulum that is oscillating, it's actually restricting and preventing the en uh, from energy of leaving the system all at once. Because notice what happens when I disconnect this, this pellet from the escape wheel. Look, all the energy is leaving the system at once and the time is going but not at its correct pace. We can see immediately that something is wrong. But we see that all wheel, all the wheels are rotating. So if we now uh, were to return it, uh, just a second, if we were now to return it, time is ticking at its correct pace again. And let us look at this clock, uh, and actually pocket watch, and see how it's made. Now, obviously, uh, this is too small to contain a pendulum, so it needs something else to regulate its rhythm. So this is, I would say, this is the brain of the clock, what sets the pace, and this is the heart that stores the energy. And so uh, what regulates the rhythm in this pocket watch is this spring, which you can see here. This is the hair spring. This spring oscillates at a given rate. Actually, there's a formula, mathematical formula, from which we can deduce the oscillation rate of this, but the way it's done today with modern uh, mechanical clocks is that it is calibrated and then tested and fine-tuned in the lab, and its oscillation rate is measured very precisely, and then the gears are used to convert uh, the time to, and, and the pace to the minutes and hour dials. But actually, what is happening here, it's all, all the same. When I turn this, I actually stretch the main uh, spring, which is hidden, we cannot see it, and it stores the energy. And then uh, if we hopefully can zoom in, there is an escape wheel right in here. And there is a pellet that goes in and out. It's pretty hard to see, but it goes in and out. And so this is what sets the pace. And then the other gears that are obscured here uh, convert the, this oscillation rate to the correct rate of rotations for the minutes and the hours dial. Now, uh, one more thing that I would like to say here, the, this puzzle was uh, a great fun to, to assemble. I assembled it with my son and he really learned a lot about clocks and it's always fun to build your for first clock. Uh, and you really learn a lot about how it works. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. 
So if you would be interested, there are links in the comments below, in the comment section, where you can buy this clock or similar to it. It's lots of fun, it's not that expensive. I would really recommend it's really quality time with your family or only with learning how it works, building it with your hands is incredible. And one more thing about the importance of time and the accuracy of time in our lives today. Many of the technologies wouldn't have been possible if we couldn't keep super accurate uh, uh, tracking of time. So today's uh, modern uh, atomic clocks, which are based on the cesium atom, which I said today, uh, said previously, they're used today to uh, actually as a definition of a second. So some number of oscillations of the cesium atom defines a second. So without the atomic clocks, it wouldn't have been possible to have technologies, for example, such as GPS, because roughly what happens with the GPS is that uh, the time where a signal is sent and when it's received is registered uh, in communication with the satellite, and then roughly it is multiplied by the speed of light. And then roughly the car knows, or whatever, the GPS knows its distance from a satellite. And then three points in space would be uh, enough, in theory, to localize the object in space, because the satellites know their location based on, on stations that are on, on the ground. This is a separate matter. But the thing is that uh, it requires more, uh, more satellites to determine it accuracy, uh, accurately. Now, what I wanted to say is that the effect of gravity on light is, uh, is, is uh, pretty significant. And so we even have to correct for the relativistic uh, effect of time, the effect of uh, gravity on time on Earth has to be corrected for. Because suppose that we could know uh, the time that it took light to travel from the device to the satellite with an accuracy of one second. Light passes 300 million meters in one second. So it wouldn't be good enough. So since light is traveling so fast, it is really important to have those super accurate atomic clocks and many other technologies are dependent on this super precise uh, uh, time, time keeping and time tracking. And I would say that today humanity has achieved the holy grail in, in time keeping. And the accuracy is incredible. And one more interesting thing that I would like to say about, for example, the Apple Watch and its similars. So the Apple Watch is based on the oscillation of quartz uh, crystal, but every once in a while it's being updated uh, through the internet with the time that is on the satellite. And the cesium clocks are so precise that they deviate only one nanosecond in a few hundred meters. And so it's really incredible that everyone who wears the Apple Watch actually uh, has this holy grail, this pinnacle of technology, this peak that allows him to know time with almost absolute accuracy. And so if you would be interested, there is also a link where you can buy this incredible Apple Watch and its similars. So build this and it, it's a lot of fun. Thank you for watching. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the, hit the bell button not to miss future uploads.